We're going to continue our study tonight on exposing Satan. In sports or war, we, we just don't know our own players and how they move in our own plays, but what the opposing team does as well, what the opposing team's strengths and weaknesses are. I know you hear um, when the Eskimos were playing and they were going to go into a game, they spent hours reviewing videotape to see how their opponent played. And this is something we as believers have got to be aware of. We're told to know how our enemy operates. Because if we don't know how he operates and what he does, it's very difficult for us to stop him and resist him. The Bible says resist him. But if we don't know how he operates, it's hard to resist him. And so we have to recognize how Satan works against us, how he shoots thoughts in our mind, puts sickness on our body, etc. We have to be able to discern him and know the difference from what he's doing and what God does. We have to be wise to his schemes, his wiles. Let's go back again to 1 Peter 5, 8. We'll read it out of the King James and then we'll read it out of the message translation. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. Number one, we must realize he cannot just go about devouring whoever he wants. He has got to find somebody in a place that he can devour. The message translation says, keep a cool head, stay alert, the devil is poised to pounce. And would like nothing better than to catch you napping. So we have been going through various things of the enemy. We are not lifting Satan up. We're exposing him. And we're not in a place where we think there's a demon behind every rose bush or every little artificial tree. We're not casting demons out of all kinds of things, out of flags and whatnot. That's not what we're here for. We don't get into some kind of a witch hunt or demon hunt. That's not the purpose. But we have got to understand and be trained to recognize him. We really can't determine Satan by our five physical senses. Hearing, touching, tasting, smelling. When we get mature with the word, our senses can be trained to recognize good and evil. But our senses are really mainly for us to be able to live on this planet. So if we taste something that's not right or spoiled, we have the sense of taste to be able to refuse that food. To spit it out. We have the touch so we know that, hey, that's hot and if I put my hand in that fire, it's going to burn. If we didn't have the sense of feeling or touch, we wouldn't know when something's too hot and we would just get burnt all the time. So the five senses are really for information to be gathered to live on this planet Earth. So how do we discern him? There's two main ways of discerning Satan and his hosts. And one is through the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. One of which is discerning of spirits. That's one of the ways for the body of Christ to discern whether it's of Satan or whether it is God. Another one is through the word of God. If it doesn't line up with the word, we don't want it. So that's the main way of discerning. Jesus' supernatural ability in us is to recognize the spirits and be able to separate them, which is of God and which is not. Remember, we had studied a few weeks back that in the church, there's going to be false prophets, false apostles, false pastors. How will we know they're false? By the Spirit. What if they start giving us some word? You see, what's happening 
is you get these false apostles, they can come in and they can teach you the word for a certain period of time and then you can get lulled into sleep and they can just next thing put some stuff in there that shouldn't be in there and just pull you away. I mean, all those people that committed suicide, that wasn't an instantaneous thing. Somewhere that leader got off track. And we need to have the discerning for it. There are these false prophets, false pastors, false people, wolves in sheep's clothing that are so experienced at lying, it's hard to discern if they're lying or not. Their whole lifestyle is just a pretense. And they come in and we think they are, and then when they fall away, what is our reaction? Do we know that they're not really falling away? But they come in and try and befriend people only to get them and then eventually pull them away. So we definitely need the discerning of spirits and also the understanding of the word of God. If you're someplace where you're hearing the word being taught and it's not truth, get out. Don't listen to part truth. You will become deceived. You will become deceived. And more so in these last days. So remember, Satan has been defeated. He is defeated. Everybody say, Jesus defeated Satan. Satan. Once and for all. all. He's under my feet. And he stays there. So, so far what we've covered, the wiles of the devil, we saw that he watches our behavior and thinks that we are his. He wants to dirty and pervert us. He wants us to become a double agent and blaspheme the Holy Spirit. He he is the accuser of the brethren and tries to get us into accusing as well. He wants to defile us. He wants to devour us. We saw that he is actually, we called him a flesh eater. He wants us to be governed by our body and our carnal nature. He's an imposter, comes as an angel of light. He pretends to be something or someone. He's not, they're not. He's a thief and he uses the doctrine of demons and seducing spirits. He's the tormentor of the mind is what we looked at last week. He fights, fires fiery darts and flaming arrows. He tries to connect with our thoughts and actions. Remember, we talked about that connector. If he has a connector, he can pull us along. And the anointing, burden-removing, yoke-destroying power has broken that connector. But we should not let him try and build another one. So tonight, we're going to look at obeys corrupt words. Satan obeys Corrupt words. Let's look at Proverbs 18. Because Satan and demons obey words. And we're going to take a little look at it and see why and how that works tonight. Uh, The law of confession was not a doctrine dreamed up by Brother Hagen. Agreed with by Brother Copeland. Not a name it and... Claim it, grab it, and blab it, and we don't need it anymore. Confession is a law that's throughout the Bible. And so in Proverbs 18, verse 20, A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth, and with the increase of his lips shall he be filled. The fruit of our mouth, is what produces for us. And what it produces will grow in around in our life. The fruit of our mouth. What is the fruit of our mouth? Words. So by our words, it will produce whatever we're speaking. And we will be satisfied and around our life, the fruit, the trees, whatever's in our garden will satisfy us and fulfill us because of the words that we speak. 
Because we're supposed to be saying what God says. When we learn how to speak God's word and follow God's laws, we will have the right fruit. But it says, and the increase of his lips, he shall be filled. So with that, it means the increase of our lips. We're speaking it more and more and more. It's not, a, I said it once, I'm done. It says this, right? A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth. So the fruit in our life, fruit is good stuff, comes as a result of our mouth. And we get increase in our life gradually because of our lips. So when we learn how increase comes by our lips speaking the word of God. We will take heed to what we're saying. Now, this is going to lead into to Satan who feeds off corrupt words. But I'm putting this. Verse 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life. Now, we know that the death isn't of God because God said the last enemy to be put underfoot is death. So God is not the author of death, because if he was, why are we calling death an enemy? And God said the last enemy to be put underfoot was death. Death is an enemy. So nothing to do with death is from God. Okay? We've got to know that. Because, uh, you know, because of Job saying, had made that statement... You hear at funerals, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. And everybody's saying that God took that person home. A baby dies, well, God took it home, need another angel. Well, let me tell you, no person will ever become an angel. Never, ever, ever, ever. We're not created as human beings and then to become an angel. So death and life are in the power of the tongue. So if I have death in my life, why do I have death in my life? What brought that death come to pass in my life? Death of money, death of any situation. The tongue. If I have abundance in my life and increase the fruit of my lips, I have life. Is that right? Jesus said, I came to give you life and that more abundantly. Jesus and the word are one. So you could say the word has come to give us abundant life. To give us increase in our life. So, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Death and life are in the power of the tongue and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. So if you like speaking... Twisted speech, which is wicked speech, you will eat the fruit of that twisted speech. If you like to gossip, which nobody here does, so it's a safe thing to use gossip. If you like to gossip, you will be bitten by it. You will eat the fruit of gossiping in your life. Somebody is going to gossip back about you. You will eat gossiping fruit. You sometimes people think, why did that person betray me? It's a good question. So, read those scriptures again. A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth, and with the increase of his lips shall be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit of it. So death and life, you eat the fruit of either death or life because of the words you speak. Let's look at um, Ecclesiastes 10.11. Surely the serpent will bite without enchantment and a babbler is no better. If 
the serpent bites before it is charmed, then it's no use to call a charmer. And the slanderer is no better than an uncharmed snake because you never know when a slanderer is going to bite. A serpent will strike. Satan will strike without enchantment. The venom of a snake can kill. And death and life are in the power of the tongue. And when somebody is made fun of or talked about because of a weakness they have or because they aren't quite what you think they should be, you are releasing venom. And eventually we will reap what we've released. That person's life could be destroyed, could be hurt. We're told to not get involved in coarse jesting. We've got to remember every word is a container and has within itself the power to release life or death. Every word. Now I can go up to you and go talk about somebody and you can say, well, I can talk about John and and I go and talk to you about John and you say, oh, well, it's okay. I can talk to you about John because he doesn't know I'm talking to you about it. It will get to him. But even if it didn't, I have released that type of thing in my life and I will reap a harvest of it. If I can't say something nice to you about Jean, then I don't say anything. When we grab hold of how powerful words are, we will make sure that if life and death are in the power of the tongue and I'm going to eat the fruit of it, that it doesn't matter who I'm saying it to, I am going to make sure those words are going to bring life. Because then I have surrounded myself with words of life. We all know we're not supposed to say what we see or what we have. We say what we want, right? Mark eleven twenty three. We're all quoting it. Whosoever shall say to that mountain and doubt not in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to ha- pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. And we say that and right on the heels of that we say something dumb. We speak words of death. And that's where a discernment needs. And Satan will try and push us into saying something. Satan knows death in the mouth. He knows when we're speaking those words. And if he can get us to use our mouth to speak things, then he can jump on that like like a chicken on a bug and work to bring it to pass. Praise God for the blood that when we realize it, we immediately cause those, uproot that thing. Amen? So he wants us to give him permission to operate in our life, in our family's life, in our marriage, in our school, in our government, which is why we're told to pray for the government. Never speak evil of your government, ever. You see something that isn't right, by the Holy Spirit, pray about it. Speak words of life into that situation. We do not possess the power to bring our words to pass. I'll say that again. We do not possess the power to bring our words to pass. We were not created to have the power to bring our words to pass. If we could bring our words to pass, we wouldn't need God. God and the angels were created 
and I'm going to show you some scripture on this, to bring man's words to pass. Again, we don't have that power. And because sometimes we think we do, we say we've done it. I've, I've said it, I've said it, I've said it. And then you go out and try and bring it to pass and we make a big mess. Or it doesn't work and we get discouraged. Which is why, like, like the word came, Carolyn, tonight says, we confess because we believe God. We believe God, not our confession. Our confession comes out of our relationship with God, out of our faith of, with God. And then our confession flows from that. So let's look at Psalm, well, Hebrews 1.14 first. Hebrews 1.14, we'll look at a... We are also told in Matthew that we'll be judged for every idle word we speak. Idle mean inoperative, non-fruit bearing, or another word is death. So God's holy angels and demons, Satan and his demon hosts, have the power to bring the words to pass, and they hearken to the words we say. Now, Hebrews 1.14, are they not all ministering spirits? Well, he, let's look at 13 first. But to which of the angels, so he's talking about angels, Sit he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. Are they not all ministering spirits? Who are ministering spirits? The angels. And who are they to minister for? The heirs of salvation. How many heirs of salvation do we have tonight? Hallelujah. So the angels' purpose that they were created for is to minister to mankind. That's their purpose. Every single angel was created to minister for the heirs of salvation. That's their job. Verse, chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. He's saying here, don't let the ministry of angels slip from our thinking and what they're doing for us and just start being a babbler and not paying any attention to what we're saying. Angels, demon spirits, they're all hearkening to the voice of man. The angels of God obey God's word. Satan and his hosts obey corrupt words, words that have death. Psalm 10320. Psalm 10320. We looked actually where we were there on Sunday. Psalm 10320. Bless the Lord, you his angels that excel in strength that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. Now, his commandments are his word. The word of God is the commands of God, the statues of God. And they hearken to the voice of the word. It doesn't say it hearkens to the voice of God. They hearken to the voice of the word. They're ministering spirits sent forth to minister for the heirs of salvation, hearkening to the word of God, the voice of the word. If they're ministering spirits sent forth to minister for the heirs of salvation, what words are they hearkening to? The word coming out of our mouth. We give voice to the word of God. So our ministering spirits can only minister for us when we are speaking the word of God. 
So sometimes we think, well, why isn't something happening that should be happening? What are we saying? They're not going to hearken to just some babble or what we might think. They're not mind readers. The angels are not mind readers. Satan is not a mind reader. The only way Satan knows what we're thinking is when we do act on it or speak it. I might decide I'm going to sit, I'm, I, I've committed. I'm going to spend from 7 until 9 o'clock tonight. I'm going to pray. I'm going to read. That's what I'm going to do. And he puts a thought in my mind. Oh, you forgot. It's a playoff. The Eskimos finally made it to the Great Cup. He will not know what that thought is until I go, oh. I think I changed my mind. And I go upstairs and turn the TV on. Then he knows if I've hearkened to his word or not. He cannot read my mind. He does not know what I'm thinking. Ever. He only knows by what I speak and by how I act. That is so important. Satan is not a supreme being. He is not a supreme being. And somehow we've lifted him up there to be this mighty man of valor. Well, he is not. He's a fallen angel. He was kicked out of heaven. Jesus defeated him. And it says that when he's revealed, the nations are going to say, Is this... Who made us tremble? And they're going to laugh at him. Can you imagine what that's going to do for his pride? It's a good idea to laugh at the devil. Just laugh at him. It really hurts his pride. So that's how we get... Our angels to work for us. There are agents in the earth. They respond to God's word. So who is Satan? Who is this devil? The angels are create, were created in heaven. You could say sort of on an assembly line. There's warring angels. So there the angels, all the warring angels came out on this warring assembly line. That's just like if you have a, a, um, a, I don't know, some kind of Volkswagen car. They're all the same, basically. They come off an assembly line. So all the warring angels came off this assembly line. The guardian angels came off of this assembly line. The seraphims off of this assembly line. The cherubims off this assembly line. And they were programmed to hearken to the word of God. All of them. Including Satan. He led praise and worship in heaven and he had instruments built right into him. So he didn't have to go and have somebody on the drums and somebody on the keyboard. He was a walking uh, symphony of musicians. I mean, all in him. Now you can see when he fell, everything got perverted. Some of the music out there is very perverted. He rebelled, got kicked out of heaven... With one third of the angels, they did not lose what they were created to do. Respond and hearken to the word of man. But they did lose their ability to do anything good. So they only hearken to corrupt words. Which is why Satan wants to get us speaking corrupt words. But they listen to our words and we license them the way we license God's angels. It's, they don't care who you are. 
they go according to the word of God. And Satan's whole purpose is to try and lift himself up above God. He still wants to do that. He knows he can. But it's like a feather in his cap if he can get one of God's children to stumble, to get into sin, to dirty themselves, to be a double agent. He can gloat. The blood wasn't enough to keep him. And that's his whole purpose of wanting us to stumble and become a double agent. To make God look bad. So every time we say, well, God made me do it. Or, or that sickness and disease is of God. We are putting God down. But giving Satan license. So that's how he was created. A car off of the assembly line, you have a key. It doesn't matter who gets in my vehicle. It does not have something in the seat to say, mm, 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 that's not Arlene. And they put the key in, they go, no, uh, 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 I'm not going to respond. It's not Arlene. It'll respond to the key no matter who's in it. And devils and angels respond to the key. It doesn't matter who you are and the key is your words. And they respond. They don't go. It's just, it's Carolyn. She plays so nicely. So we're not, we're not going to hearken to anything she says that isn't nice. She doesn't speak nice, they're going to hearken. They don't care what she does. This is why the law of confession is so important. It's vital. But not to get into, it, there's no reason people get into this, well, should I say this and should I say that? If we're in the word of God and we're operating in the gifts of the spirit, we won't have a problem saying what's wrong. The only time we'll say what's wrong is if Satan can get to our carnal nature, make us think we want something, and then speak stupid. Or I'm trying to impress, I, want, I need you for a friend and I'm going to try and impress somebody, so I'm going to say something stupid. Or I want you to listen to me and think I've got something important to say, so I'm going to gossip. That's the only way. That's the only way. Deception is his game. So they were all created. And I'm not getting into a lot of it because that's not the purpose of tonight's study or that's a whole other study for weeks and weeks. But they had a different function only at summer warring angels and as I said, guardian angels. But the way they operate is hearkening to the word of God. I don't even have to say, and I've done it a lot. And ministering spirits in Jesus' name, go out and bring my finances in. Well, it's not that it's wrong, but all I really have to do, according to the word of God, I've sown and now I reap. And when I say that, my ministering spirits actually go out and get it because they they don't listen to me say ministering spirits go. Because really, there, there's not a scripture for me to say ministering spirits go. We get into these kind of things sometimes. But all I have to do is say, I have given. Therefore, it's given back to me. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into my bosom. They go out and find men to give into my bosom. I don't have to tell them to go. They're just hearkening to my word. Which is why speaking over your tithe is so important. Do you see that now? I tithe. Father, I thank you. I've obeyed your word. I've tithed. The windows of heaven are open. You pour out a blessing. The devourer is rebuked. Now my ministering spirits go see to it that Satan cannot devour my stuff. Why speak? This is why speaking over your giving, your tithes, is so good, vital. I can take my tithe. And if this is my tithe, then I can just go and put it in the basket. I don't say a word. 
nothing's accomplished. My ministering spirits do not see me do that and go forth. They hearken to the voice of my me, the word when I speak it. The word of God activates God's angels. My words of corruptness activate demon hosts. So that being the case, I go, my body is strong. The healing power of Jesus floods through my body. My heart is strong. My liver is strong. My kidneys are strong. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in me and quickens my mortal body. And the angels of God go, now I've got something to work with. I can do something. The demon spirits can't do anything. I didn't speak their language. If I go, oh, you wouldn't believe it. I just feel so terrible. You wouldn't believe it. Oh, oh, my, my little finger hurts. Oh, oh, it's so bad. It's so bad. The evil spirits go, ah, now we've got something to work with. Do you see this? We're releasing one or the other because they were created to be agents for the heirs of salvation. When they fell, they became corrupt, evil, ugly, and they only bring corruption to pass, which is why Satan waits, Satan, his host, for corrupt words. So this is why with our children, our family, our grandchildren, our uncles, our aunts, we speak the word of God over them. We say, Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord of the harvest, I ask you to send laborers into Uncle Doodad's life. And so off they go. And then I say, you know what? I don't know if Uncle Doodad will ever get saved. He's the meanest creature that ever lived. Now I have released Satan's hosts into Brother Doodad or Uncle Doodad's life. That is how Satan operates. We're exposing him, right? That's the purpose, to expose him and how he works. So once Lucifer was kicked out of heaven, his name was Lucifer... With him, one-third of the angels, we now call them evil spirits, demons. They are in this earth's atmosphere. You read in the Bible, there's unclean spirits or demons. They make you act unclean, think unclean, go to unclean places, hang out with unclean people, do unclean things. You want to know why somebody's doing unclean things? It's because it's an unclean spirit. They're seducing spirits. They entice you. There's a deceiving spirit, and that's self-explanatory. The fallen angel is a demon. And one other thing, there is no scriptural evidence, no scripture that says that human spirits are in the earth. Once people die, they go to a holding tank in hell until the final judgment, or it says to be absent from the body is to be present from the Lord. So if you have any of these silly seance things where somebody says, oh, I I talked, it had the same voice. We talked about this before. That is a familiar spirit. You go... I've had people say, oh, this person died, a husband, a wife, a child, whatever. And you know, I went such and such a place and I could smell them. They figured that person was there watching over them. No, they're not. They're in heaven. That was an evil spirit. That simple. Because if we start thinking that's the spirit of a loved one come to watch over us, we're going to start talking to them and next thing you know, they're going to lead us down a garden path and often suicide. 
There are zero human spirits without a body in the earth today. Once they die, they're either with the Lord or they're in, in Hades. Done. Simple. That's it. You say, well, I heard their voice. Well, it could be a memory. It could also be a familiar spirit speaking. We need wisdom. And it'll keep us from falling in a ditch and getting buried. So as I said, Satan and all the angels were programmed to hearken to the word of God. They fell, now they hearken to evil, corrupt words. And that word of God is spoken by us. So the angels, if I say something dumb, my angels cannot, cannot respond. If I say, oh, I think if if I go out tonight, you know, the roads, I'm going to go. But sure as anything, I'll probably go be in an accident. My angels can do nothing about it. They're programmed to listen to the word of God. Now, if I say I'm protected, the blood of Jesus protects me, my angels surround me, they will be there. If I say I'm going to probably get in an accident, Satan saying demons will go, hmm, let's see what we can do about that. That's the way God made it. Which is why in Hebrews I read, let's not forget this great ministry of our ministering spirits. When we realize it's one or the other, it'll really clean up our mouth. We have to use some wisdom. We have to use wisdom. So demons and Satan do not know how to do anything good. Therefore, if it's good, don't ever attribute it to Satan or his demons. He perverts everything. He can do no good. Satan and his demons do no good. No good thing comes from Satan and his demons. I don't know if any of you have ever heard people... You know, giving Satan credit for good stuff. He can do no good. God is good. Hallelujah. So speak life to your money, which is the word of God. Speak life to your job. Always speak life. Don't get in this negative thing that works. Speak life. It'll raise you up. Your angels will go to work for you on the job, bringing in what's necessary. So you have favor. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. So, remember, we don't get into... Sometimes we we don't think about what we're doing and, and even like when we make a confession... Like when I say, um, you know, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in me and quickens my mortal body. We don't, that, 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 that is good. But when we say it, we've got to say it with the realization our ministering spirits have hearkened. They've hearkened. Glory to God. They've hearkened. Every time you travel out of town, you speak protection. Your angels have hearkened. Hallelujah. We never speak contrary to the word of God. Amen? Hallelujah. So we've seen the wiles of the devil. He watches our behavior and thinks you are his. He wants to dirty and pervert you. Double agency. Wants you to be a Christian on Sunday and something else at home or at work. Wants to try and get us to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. He's accuser of the brethren. And really, if he hearkens to words, 
He uses us to accuse the brethren. He wants to get us defiled. So we're displeasing to God. God always loves us. Always. He will never ever stop loving us. But the reason he wants us to get defiled, pervert us, all those things, is so it's a bad mark against God. As I've said before, the reason I st- I'll just stand and stand and stand regarding healing or other things is because Jesus' blood paid for it and I'm not going to give Satan the opportunity to take something I've done and rub it in God's nose. Now you can see why I say there's no such thing as a gray area. It's got to be one or the other. The Bible says, let your yea be yea and your nay, nay. No gray. Righteousness, unrighteousness, godliness, ungodliness, holiness, lewdness. How can you be half holy? How can, the, how can you be half holy? Holy on Sunday and the rest of the week unholy? That, that, that just doesn't wash. When you say it that way, you can see how silly that is. It doesn't wash. He's an imposter, comes as an angel of light. He's a thief. He's a tormentor of the mind. And he tries to get us to speak corrupt words. We've exposed Satan. Amen? Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah.